So I haven't made a preface to my videos in a long time, so I'm going to make a brief one here today. Praise God that the weather has been rather warm throughout the winter here. We got a little bit of snow last couple of days. It got a little colder, but we're already towards the end of February. It's 22nd, right? And so usually in February, it, we're deep in snow, and it's ice everywhere. It's cold, bitterly cold. But this year, it's been extremely warm. It's been hovering around, around freezing point. Right? It's the below, it's the above, you know, but praise God and thank you for your prayers on that. So that's helped relieve a lot of stress, a lot of suffering that could have happened. And also, you know, uh, Putin and Russia's uh, attempts to destroy the infrastructure here and the power grid has not gone well for them. So we have been protected here on that end as well. So praise God and I thank you so much for your prayers. Keep praying for us and our safety here. I am ministering the gospel of Christ here uh, among them. They're suffering because, they, like I said, you know, it's been a year now, and they still can't return to their homes. So many people are still staying here in this part of Ukraine, and they still have no home, and they still are suffering. They've started to get their life a little bit more together, but there's still a lot of question. A lot of people are fleeing Ukraine still, if they can. The men cannot if they're between 18 and 60, unless they have at least three children. So otherwise they're stuck here. They cannot leave. Some men are choosing to stay because, for example, their mother-in-law is sick and you know old and can't travel, and so they're, they're staying to take care of her. The family is. But I'm still here, and I'm a minister of the gospel, and I depend on your donations to continue to do the work of the gospel among the Ukrainians. So I'm asking you to look in your heart, see what the work is that God has done in your heart. Out of that, be generous to support me over here so that others can have the opportunity for God to work in their hearts as well through the gospel and through the gospel actions of a minister who is following Christ, given up his life for Christ. I'm here. I'm in harm's way. We still don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. It's not safe at all. So I am in danger. But it's not for that that you are giving. It's so that you can give an opportunity to Ukrainians to hear the gospel, to see the gospel. What good work did God do in your heart? Don't you want that for someone else? So look and see what you can give to my ministry to help me. I have needs every month because I have rent, I have utilities, I have food I have to buy throughout the month. I've got other needs as well. I need to get to the dentist, have dental work. If there is a physical medical emergency, I've got to get to the doctor. I have to buy clothes. So I have those needs like every one of you do. I am in need, as I'm a minister over here, ministering the gospel, and I depend on your donations to help and to give me that support as I'm doing the work. I'm physically here doing the work. And in that, you become a partner in this ministry. And I pray for you, and I praise God for you. When I get before God in the evening or in the morning, and I pray, Praise God for you. You are part of this ministry. And I thank you very much. Now on with the lesson. I want you to take your Bible translation. I want you to open to Romans 8, verse 1. And I want you to read that out loud with me. I'm reading from the New King James Version. I want you to read from your version that you've got available. Now, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Is that where yours ends? Is there anything else in verse 1 after that? 
because in most translations, that's where the verse ends. But that's not where the verse ends that God wrote. It continues. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Okay? Now, you're going to freak out if you have one of those translations that's missing that critical part. But if you are missing that critical part, you can find it again down in verse 4. That the righteous requirements of the that the righteous requirement, singular, of the law might be fulfilled, that's to fill up what is missing, might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, I'm going to show you the deception that most teachers make using verse 1 in order to continue their false doctrine, even heresy, that we're saved by faith alone. You're going to freak out if you're one of those who has heard this all your life, that we're saved by faith alone. Not by works, but by faith alone. Okay? Let me explain to you that we have over a thousand plus videos on this channel. I am a biblical scholar. God made me a professional linguist at the age of 17 years old. It's not a hobby. I was actually paid, even in my training, starting at the age of 17 years old. I've studied ancient Greek for many years before I went to seminary. When I got to seminary, I continued my studies of ancient Greek. How many languages have I studied? You ready? I'll tell you the languages. My first language was French. I've studied Spanish and German. I've studied Swedish, Finnish, Czech, Slovak, Czech. I achieved a native proficiency in Slovak, Polish, ancient Greek, ancient Hebrew, Russian, now Ukrainian. Is that enough? I think, I think I've hit on all the languages that I've studied. Now, I didn't reach a proficiency level in all those languages. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that I have studied all of those languages. So God has raised me up specifically for the translation of the scriptures into English. Now, I'm going to talk to you about how these men distort this particular passage in order to support their false doctrine of saved by faith alone. Now, the reason why I'm talking about this is because on our website, we've got, like I said, over a thousand videos, and most of them address at some point in the video, if not the entire video, faith versus works. And it's really not about faith versus works. That's just an abbreviation for what people use. And the people who believe in faith alone, they want to make it about faith or works. But that's not what the debate is about. And there's really no debate. Because when you read the scriptures, you know what it says. It never, ever, ever says faith alone. We are saved by faith with works. Because faith without works is dead. It exactly says that in Scripture. Go look in the book of Jacob. You say, my Bible doesn't have a book called Jacob. Your Bible has a book called Jacob, but it's not called that in English anymore. It was. It was changed with the rise of the Reformation to James. In all the other languages around the world, it's Jacob. I did a survey of 
all the languages around the world their Bible with that book name. So, I'm telling you, the debate is not about faith versus works by itself. It's about faith versus faith and works together. And the Bible constantly says faith and works. And if it doesn't say exactly faith and works, it will say faith and then it'll explain works as something that is necessary to faith. Now, if you haven't run away yet because you're so infuriated and you say, you're a false teacher because you don't believe what Martin Luther believed or you don't believe what I hear in church. Okay? If you haven't run away from that, hear me out. Okay? Let's have a closer look at that. Look at verse 4. All right? Let's read that again. Verse 4 that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. What they will do with that is they will say, well, that means that we are walking by faith because they equate the Spirit with faith and the flesh with works. That's what they do. That's their fatal mistake. Okay? All right? That's not what the Bible says about the flesh and the Spirit. The flesh isn't about actions. Otherwise, when we do good actions, then we're doing works of the flesh. Right? We're doing actions of the flesh. That's their argument, is that any action is an action of the flesh, because it's an action. But that's not what the Bible means. All right? Hold your finger there and turn to Galatians chapter 5. You, you, if you've read the comments in some of these videos, you know that that's, this is the most often um, cited passage for me in the comments to address the people coming to the videos and misbehaving themselves. Verse 19, Galatians 5, 19, it says, Now the works of the flesh, the actions of the flesh, are evident which are. I want you to scan through that list real fast. Go ahead and look at it on your own. Now I want you to tell me, write in the comments if, if you find anything in that list that is a good thing, that's not a sin. Everything in that list is a sin. Not only that, it's not a complete list, and it says so. Verse 21, Envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. So at the end of the list, it says, and the like, and things like this. It's not a complete list. He's trying to give you an indication that sin, particular concrete sins, are works of the flesh, the actions of the flesh. The flesh doesn't mean our physical body. And the spirit doesn't mean our spiritual body. And that's the mistake that they make. They are metaphors for the part of us inside that wants to focus on our life is only what we see and our few years here on earth. That part in us is the flesh. And that is what gives rise to all of these sins that are listed throughout the scriptures. You can go to the website. I will put a link down here to it. There's a, a page with lists of sins in the New Testament. Someone asked me about that, and so I put together this page. I guess it's maybe got 20 different places in the New Testament that lists sins, all right, that are with the works of the flesh. The works of the flesh are the sins that we do, okay? So when it says, walk not according to the flesh, it means that we are not doing sin. That's not, it's not a contrast of action versus faith. Persuasion. Because faith literally means persuasion, the Greek word. So it's not, it's not action versus persuasion. 
It's not that, well, I walk according to persuasion and you walk according to action, therefore you're going to hell. What? Have you read the New Testament? Because John says that if you don't love your brother who you do see, how can you love God whom you don't see? So that completely destroys that right there. Because John says if you don't do concrete, visible, physical actions to help your brother who's in need, well, then that would be the work of the flesh according to them. That's walking according to the flesh then. And not only that, John says that those actions actually support us when our hearts, if our hearts condemn us in the presence of God. If our hearts condemn us in the presence of God, then those actions support us and prove that we are of the truth. So therefore, not all actions are of the flesh. Okay? Turn with me to 1 John, so you can see this with your own eyes. It's very important for you to understand this so they can't deceive you on it. <clears throat> so look at this. So we're in John, 1 John 3.16, not John 3.16, 1 John 3.16. By this we know love, because he, Jesus, laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. That's an action. That would be walking according to the flesh then. And you say, well, no, because walking according to the flesh is, is saying that that has some value in your salvation. Okay, let's keep going. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need, that's physical need, and shuts up his heart from him, not doing anything, how does the love of God abide in him? If you don't do those actions, the love of God does not abide in you. You won't be saved. You won't be saved. In fact, that's the teaching of the sheep and the goats. The last teaching Jesus gave before he went to the cross was that if you see someone in need and you don't do anything about it, you're doing that to me, Jesus said. And you will depart with the goats to the place reserved for the devil and his angels to burn forever. Let's keep going. Verse 18, my little children. So he's address, he, this is a letter to Christians. He's addressing, and you can see in, in ver, chapter 2, he addresses the infants in the faith, my little children. He's addressing the young men in the faith and the fathers in the faith. He never addresses unbelievers in this letter. This letter is to believers, or those who call themselves believers, okay? Because we see at the very beginning, John separates out the true believers from the fake believers, those who are walking around in sin, but claiming that they have fellowship with the Father. It says they lie, and they do not do the truth. But those who have stopped sinning, the blood of Jesus Christ is effective in purging you of all sin. 1 John 1, 7. Now let's keep going here. Verse 18. 1 John 3, 18. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Deed is action. Deed, work, action, all the same word in Greek. Look at that. John says, let us, that means we must not. It's the imperative. We must not love in word or in tongue, but in deed action and in truth so walking according to the flesh is not referring to action 
It's referring to specific actions, which are sins, not all actions, because we're commanded, we're commanded to love in action and in truth. Verse 19, you say, yeah, but it still doesn't have anything to do with whether we're saved or not. It does. We just showed that it did. How can the love of God abide in him if he doesn't do these actions to take care of the needs of his brother? that he sees and he has the ability to take care of. Verse 19. And by this, by what? When he says, we must not love in word or in tongue, but in action and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. He knows what you've done in action and truth of love to your brother who is in need. And you had what you could to help him, and you helped him. This assures our hearts before God, our Actions of love, concrete actions of love, assure our hearts before God whenever our hearts condemn us. And God is greater than our hearts, and He knows all things. He knows what you've done in action and in truth. Okay? Galatians now the works of the flesh, the actions of the flesh, same word as deeds. Notice how they you know, willy-nilly translate it different ways based on what they want to deceive you about, right? And yet the truth is still there. But it says, now the actions of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, uh, the word dissension is sedition, actually, literally. Envy, murders, and it goes on. These are all sins. The actions of the flesh are not just anything that you do that's an action. Otherwise, 1 John would be lying. And 1 John is the Holy Spirit's testimony from God through John to you, to us. Back to Romans 8 who do not walk according to the flesh. And that word according is in synchronicity with. Who do not walk in synchronicity with the flesh. Well, walking is a physical action, isn't it? So flesh must not be referring to the body because walking you do by using your body. Every action that you do during the day, you're using your body to do. That's what walking refers to. In the scriptures, when it's used this way about spiritual things, walking refers to the actions you're doing in your day. So when you read that, right, walk, think actions that I'm doing during the day, in general, neutrally speaking. Am I walking in bad things or am I walking in good things? See, so walking is neutral. Not flesh. Flesh is not neutral. Now, there are some rare occasions where Paul uses it in a neutral way, but it's very clear from the context that he is, because he's not addressing issues of morality and right and wrong and good and bad. But here he is. Here he's drawing a line. He says, either you're walking according to the flesh in synchronicity with the flesh, those desires of the flesh, the works of the flesh, the actions of the flesh, which are sins, he lists them so you'll know. Or you're walking according to the Spirit, which are the fruits of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, which is also in Galatians. He goes from the actions of the flesh down to verse 22. Well, read verse 21. Um, 
of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you, this is about the sins, actions of the flesh, in time past, that those who practice such things, that's walking, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. If you are walking in those, you are not in Christ Jesus, and you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is, there's not a single sin listed here, the fruit of the Spirit. Are you walking according to the Spirit or according to the flesh? In synchronicity with the Spirit of God or in synchronicity with the flesh of man, of the earth? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Of course, they're not sins. Sin is law-breaking, John says in 1 John. Sin is law-breaking. And so the actions of the flesh, which are all sins, are breaking the law. And that's what Paul is implying here about the previous lists in the same passage. That those sins are breaking the law. Those actions. The actions of the flesh are breaking the law. The actions of the Spirit are not breaking the law. Because love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, they're all actions. You say, those are feelings. They're not feelings. They're actions. You may feel love and not show love in your actions. Are you loving them? Oh, but I, I feel love for you. Then why are you beating me? Stop beating me. But I love you. Stop it. Right? That would be a crazy person, wouldn't it? So back to Romans 8, verse 4 that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk in synchronicity with the flesh, but in synchronicity with the Spirit. All those things that are good, not all those things that are evil and sinful. That the righteous, it, it says, uh, but according to the Spirit, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. What are the things of the flesh? Well, we read that in Galatians 5. The actions of the flesh are the things of the flesh. The actions of the Spirit are the things of the Spirit. Love, faith, goodness, kindness, long-suffering, patience, gentleness. Those are the things of the Spirit. But adultery, fornication, lewdness, anger and wrath, reviling, sedition, strife, creating strife, heresies, those are all sins. Those are the things of the flesh. For those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. So if you are doing those things, you are setting your mind on those things. That's what he says. But those who live according to the Spirit, those who do the actions of the Spirit, set their minds on the things of the Spirit. It's not the other way around. You don't set your mind on that and then do it. You do it, and then you set your mind on it. And we find the same in John 3 where Jesus is, is explaining what the condemnation is. For they hated the light because their actions were evil. They chose evil actions, and that determined the orientation of their heart and their mind to be set on those things which are evil and against those things which are good. For to be carnally minded, that word carnal is flesh. It's the adjective for fleshly minded. For to be fleshly minded is death. But to be spiritually minded, that's not, a, that's not about faith versus works, actions. 
It's not persuasion versus actions. In either case, you have persuasion and actions, persuasion and actions. Are you persuaded according to the flesh and the fleshly mind? Or are you persuaded according to the spiritual things and the spiritual mind? Which one? And then your actions are accordingly. For to be fleshly minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the fleshly mind, carnal mind, is enmity against God. Not all actions are enmity against God. You think that loving your brother by taking care of his physical needs when you have something to meet those needs is enmity against God? Then why do you say that the flesh is about any actions? in contrast with persuasion or faith. No. They have completely perverted through and through the Scriptures with that wicked doctrine. Walking according to the flesh is doing the actions of sin. And walking according to the Spirit is doing the actions of the Spirit, which are the fruit of the Spirit. And if you are in Christ Jesus, you do not walk in synchronicity with the actions of the flesh, but in synchronicity with the actions of the Spirit. And those lists, those two lists in Galatians 5, will keep you rooted. So this guy, he's uh, shown on this webpage very clearly that he believes in faith alone, saved by faith alone, and that all works, if we depend on works at all in our salvation, that that is wicked. So, he says, Hell is only for the devil and his angels, and all humanity who die in their sins without Jesus Christ as their Savior. Well, that's interesting, because Jesus says in the sheep and the goats, in Matthew, this is verse 33, and he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. Where does he say anything about their faith or their persuasion? None of those say anything about persuasion. Well, they do, implicitly, not explicitly. And that's the problem. Is that they want to make it into persuasion versus action or faith versus works. It's not about that. It's about, is it faith with works or is it faith without works that we're saved? Because if it's without works, you've already contradicted directly what the Bible says. Faith without works is dead. Turn with me. In your Bible, it's called the book of James. In the Bible, it's called the book of Jacob. Okay, so we're on the same issue that John was teaching on. Okay? Verse 14 of chapter 2. James 2.14. Or really Jacob 2.14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? So that alone says it doesn't profit at all. Okay? There's no benefit to it. If you say you have faith, but you do not have works, there's no benefit to that faith, including salvation. But what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? Can faith save him? Those are both rhetorical. And he, he's going to prove that faith cannot save him if it does not have works. That's why the book of Jacob, or James, is absolutely critical to understanding the New Testament. Because on that point, we've had a great rebellion against the gospel of Jesus Christ in the form of Luther and then Calvin. I'm not a, I'm not a Catholic. I'm not calling you to 
Catholicism or to become a Catholic. I have plenty of criticism of them as well. Although, as I say before, and I'll tell you now, that Protestantism is the biggest monster in the room right now against the gospel of Jesus Christ. Just keep going. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Rhetorical question meaning no, it cannot. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? He's trying to teach you spiritual things through physical things. But what you hear from Reformed teachers such as R.C. Sproul, who's passed on to the judgment, and I'm sure he's sitting in the lake of burning sulfur soon. He's in hell waiting for that. He will teach that this is talking about only the physical. Even Jesus in John 3 tried to teach Nicodemus through physical things and talking about physical things, spiritual things, but could not move on to purely spiritual things because Nicodemus insisted on twisting what Jesus was saying by Nicodemus arguing born again when Jesus kept saying born from above. And all of you out there, Come onto the channel say, you got to be born again, born again, born again, born again, born again. You are teaching Nicodemus' earthly, demonic gospel, not Jesus's. Jesus' gospel is born from above, not born again. You are on earthly things. You cannot understand spiritual things. You resist it. You resist it because you love your sin. And that's why you love this doctrine that I can't help but sin as long as I'm in the body gives you an excuse. What are you going to say to God? Well, you know, I mean, that's what the Bible says, doesn't it? Didn't you say that? The man can't help but sin as long as he's in the body? No, I said, do not sin. I said to you through Paul, awake to righteousness and do not sin. I said to you through Jesus twice, go and sin no more. Stop sinning or something worse may happen. I said to you through John, my dear children, I write to you, the infants in the faith, the new ones, so that you may not sin. And again, and again, and again. And my apostle Peter, God will say to you, reminded you what I said all the way back in the beginning of my testimony, which was relevant even then to Christians and to you. Be holy, because I am holy. And you would not do it. And you held on to this false teaching that I can't help but sin. It's not my fault. If you can't help but sin, it's not your fault, right? You're a victim. Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. James 2.17. You cannot get more direct than that. Faith, there, uh, thus also, faith by itself alone, that's what that word is, alone, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Notice how they avoided saying faith alone. Because if they did, they would be fighting against their own reformation. That's right. Because these are Protestants who made this Bible, this version. Thus also faith by itself, faith alone, if it does not have works, is dead. How can faith that is dead save you? You can't be saved through that faith. That faith is dead. It's not able to do anything. Verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works. And I will show you my faith by my works. Verse 19, you believe that there is one God? You do well. 
Even the demons believe and tremble. He's mocking them. Saying, you think that you're doing well. He's not, he's not telling them, oh, that's good, that's good, that's good. Okay. You'll be saved. He's mocking them by contrasting that with what the demons believe. Because everyone knows the demons will not be saved. You believe that there is one God? You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Why do they tremble? Because they do not obey the faith that they have. They have faith. They have persuasion. They know who Jesus was. Read the Gospel of Mark. In the first three chapters, you got demons crying out who Jesus is. Jesus, the Son of the Most High God, what do you have to do with us? Has our time come already? The demons knew. They know who Jesus is. They have persuasion. They have faith. They have faith. But it's not living faith because it doesn't have the actions. And you must have the actions to have the faith that saves. And if you do not have the actions, you do not have the faith that saves. Therefore, actions are critical to your salvation. Absolutely. Verse 20. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Now he gets more serious. He calls you a fool. When I call you a fool for continuing to vomit this heresy all over my channel or against my comments on other videos, and I call you a fool, and you go, oh! Open right here. Verse 20. James 2.20. But do you want to know, O oh fool, the faith without works is dead. All right? You got it? Everywhere you turn in the scriptures, it says the same thing. God's testimony is true. God's testimony is consistent. It says the same thing. So when they talk about saved by faith, you understand by reading James, they're not talking about just any faith apart from action. They're talking about faith that has action. As Jacob says, James says, that faith without works is dead, and you're a fool if you think that you can be saved by faith and not have works that accompany a living faith. Therefore, there are two kinds of faiths, but the kind of faith that saves, and every time it says that you're saved by faith, you must keep this in mind in context of the entire testimony of God. It's not just any faith. It's not dead faith where there are no actions that accompany it. Or there are actions of the flesh accompanying it. It's faith with works. The works of the Spirit by which you walk in synchronicity. And you reject walking in synchronicity with the flesh. Listen, if you think it's okay to walk in synchronicity of the flesh and Jesus will forgive you, why don't you murder when you are angry with someone? What stops you from doing that? Well, I don't want to go to jail. Oh, that's the worst? That's why? And you think you're not walking in synchronicity with the flesh? Are you joking? No fear of what God might do to you, but fear of what man might do to you for sinning. You don't know Jesus. I declare to you that you do not know Jesus. You don't know Jesus. You know about Jesus. You feel good about Jesus, but you don't know Jesus. If you fear what man can do to you for a sin, but you do not fear at all that God might do something much worse to you, you don't know Jesus.
Do not fear what man can do to you. I kill you, even. But fear what God can do to you when he throws you into the fires of hell. He'll destroy your body. Your soul will be in torment forever and ever and ever. No man can do that to you. No man can do that to you. You need to stop mocking when I tell you you're going to hell because it only proves that you don't know Jesus. Hell is a serious thing. Hell is absolutely critical to us understanding the gospel. And if you don't take the warnings about hell seriously, and you mock the preachers who talk about going to hell, you are going to hell. There is no doubt at all that you're going to hell if you are mocking preachers who talk about going to hell. I can't account for the motivations of other preachers, but for me, I tell it to you so that you have an opportunity to repent now and avoid going to hell. That's love. I don't have to waste my time telling you that you're going to hell and put up with your vicious attacks for me preaching the gospel to you that Jesus preached. Not the gospel of these false teachers in all of these churches across America. Rick Warren, Greg Laurie, etc., etc., etc. John Piper, yes, John Piper, John MacArthur, they're all false teachers. They're teaching you another gospel. It is the gospel of Luther and Calvin, not the gospel of Jesus. Take our 40 day Jesus challenges in the description below. We don't ever charge for anything, it's not something you have to go buy or sign up for. It's a web page with a reading schedule of the gospel accounts, starting with Mark. And you'll end up going through all four by the end, but you're simply reading the gospel accounts. Go do it. Take 40 days. Do what it says in the preface. Cut yourself off from all people who are talking about Christianity or Christ or the Bible. And put yourself under the Lord God and His testimony and listen and read and get rid of everything that you've learned before from church and just read and just saturate yourself in it. You need to stop walking according to the flesh. The sins that you think that you can't help but do as long as you're in the body. How about lying? What sins do you think that you can't help but do what when you can't help but murder then why don't you murder when you're angry if you can't help but sin as long as you're in the body why don't well it's kind of random you know it's whatever my body wants and and he tries to keep me in suspense so that it just happens suddenly really where is that in scripture where does it talk about it that way in scripture it doesn't talk about sin that way in scripture the inevitability of sin no by surprise and random. So lying, what about lying? You can't help but lie as long as you're in the flesh? Lie is intentional. Oh no, it's accidental. No, it's not. Lying is intentional. And you will go to hell for that and then the lake of burning sulfur. Lying, you can't help but lie as long as you're in the flesh? Then why does Jesus condemn all liars? All liars, Revelation 21, 8. And all liars, shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. It's absolutely crystal clear. And it says repeatedly, God does not show partiality. God is impartial. He doesn't show favoritism towards anyone. Even if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, God will not show favoritism to you. You will still be judged according to your actions. It says repeatedly throughout the New Testament and even in the Old Testament, but especially to Christians in the New Testament, that God will judge every person according to his actions, we'll say, and God does not show favoritism. Say the same thing. These are to Christians, not to unbelievers. We are being told that God does not show favoritism. 
and that God judges every person according to their actions, and we're even told to live our life here on this earth in fear. If we have faith in God, who judges every man's actions and doesn't show favoritism, we are to live our life here in fear, and we're told to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. You better listen closely. But more than that even, you better do what you hear. May the Lord bless you as you seek Him with all your heart.